do three points in 3D space fully and uniquely define a sphere? What I mean by that, just to be ultra clear about this, is that if I have a three-dimensional space where I've got an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis, and we choose three distinct points floating out here in space someplace, does that uniquely define a sphere? Again, just to be super clear about what I mean, is I'm asking if I told you that these three points had to belong to the surface of the sphere. So I, I don't mean that any of these points belong inside the sphere. I don't mean that any of the points are the center of the sphere. No, no, no. What I'm trying to say is if I told you these three points had to belong to the surface of the sphere, would that uniquely define a sphere? And this requires a little bit of like 3D imagination, but the answer is no. There's actually many, many, many spheres, you know, infinitely many spheres, you could say, who have all three of these points lying on the surface. So the answer is no. And then the next question I would ask after this is, well, what if I had four points in 3D space? Does that fully and uniquely define a sphere? So now you've formed your opinion about this, you know, you've had a guess, yes or no. Um, the answer is yes, uh, specifically if they are not coplanar. And what I mean by coplanar is that uh, they don't belong to the same plane. Um, so as long as these four points in 3D space do not belong to the same plane, then yes, they would fully and uniquely define a sphere that has all four of those points on the surface of the sphere. And now, now that we know this, and suppose that someone gave you four points in 3D space that were not coplanar, how would you go about finding the center and radius of a sphere that, that actually has all four of those points on the surface of the sphere? This is an interesting question. And so what we're going to do to find the center and the radius of the sphere with these points is I'm going to say, well, let me call the points P1. And P1 has coordinates um, x1, y1, z1, and then P2 has coordinates x2, y2, z2, and then P3 is my third point, has coordinates x3, y3, z3, and then lastly P4 is my fourth point, and that has coordinates x4, y4, z4. Now let's recall that the formula in standard form for a sphere in 3D space was this. x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared plus z minus z naught squared equals r squared. And this is something we talked about really close to the beginning of the year. Um, and in this formula for the sphere, the center of the sphere has coordinates x naught, y naught, z naught, and then of course the radius of the sphere is r. So if we knew the center and the radius of the sphere, we could write out the equation that describes that sphere in 3D space. But also if we knew an equation that describes the sphere in 3D space, then we could just read off the coordinates of the center of the sphere and the radius of the sphere, and that's what we were getting, that's what we're trying to find here. So that's going to be our goal, is we're going to try to find an equation of this form that is solved by these four solutions to this equation. So what does that look like? I'm going to write out a system of equations using, I can't choose a color, <laughs> how about green? Um, 
And this system of equations is going to look really repetitive. It's going to be x naught, sorry, x1 minus x naught squared plus y1 minus y naught squared plus z1 minus z naught squared minus r squared equals zero. So what I did is I took the standard form equation for a sphere, and I subtracted r squared from both sides so that the right side could be zero, and then I could move this r squared to be negative r squared on the left side. The other thing I did is instead of just having x, y, and z be variables, now instead of variables, I said, well, this point has to lie on the sphere, right? If it lies on the sphere, then it must satisfy this equation. And so I can plug in x1, y1, and z1, the coordinates of my first point, into this equation, and this also must be true. I can do the same thing with the four other points, right? If I plug in the coordinates of my second point, that must lie on the sphere, then this equation must also be true because again, the second point lies on the sphere. And there's two more equations that I can write using the coordinates of the remaining two points. And like I said, this is gonna be kind of repetitive, um, kind of a hassle to write out, but I think you see where this is going. Um, last equation here for my fourth point coordinates of a point that must belong to the sphere, so it must satisfy this equation, and we're done. Okay, so now I have a system of equations that has four equations and four unknowns. My four unknowns that I'm looking for here are gonna be, um, let me go ahead and write this as a vector, because that's where we're going with this anyways. The four unknowns that I'm looking to find are x naught, y naught, z naught, and r. Since I have a system of equations with four equations and four unknowns, that's a pretty good sign. If these were linear equations, we could actually just solve this, you know, a system of four linear equations with four unknowns, you could solve that really easily with Gaussian elimination. We've talked about that before. But since this system of equations is not linear, then we cannot use Gaussian elimination. I'll repeat that. Gaussian elimination only works for systems of linear equations. And in this case, this is a system of nonlinear equations. So that's not going to work for us. Instead, what we do when we want to solve a system of nonlinear equations is we are going to use Newton's method for finding the zeros of a multivariable vector valued function. Okay. Man, you guys, at this point, I'm highly irritated. Just on a personal note, I finished recording a one hour video that I thought was really nice, and then my computer froze, and the only thing that I could recover were those first nine minutes. So I'm gonna re-record this again, but if I seem a little irritated, uh, that's what's going on. Now, to the best of my memory, where we had left off as we were, we were talking at this point about this system of equations, and when we have a system of equations, the way we're gonna solve this um, is using Newton's method for finding zeros of a multivariable vector valued function. Um, we've talked about that formula in a previous video. If this system of equations were a linear system of equations, meaning every single equation in the system of equations is a linear equation, then we could solve that system of equations using Gaussian elimination. But since this is a non-linear system of equations, and again, I want to make this clear, if even one of those equations were non-linear, 
then you cannot use Gaussian elimination, and we have to use Newton's method, as we're about to do. So, in a previous video, I told you that Newton's method for finding zeros of a multivariable vector-valued function has a formula that looks something like this. And we talked about how um, that J inverse is the inverse Jacobian matrix. This function is a vector-valued function, so that would be a vector. And then these x's are also vectors, right? That's my solution vector. And um, what I'm going to do for the purpose of this video is I'm going to rename these. And so I'm going to name the vectors u for my solution vector, for the iterates of my solution vector, um, because I'm already using the letter x to represent the x coordinates of my points and, you know, just x coordinate in 3D space. And so I don't want to reuse that as the name of my vector. That would just get confusing. So now I'm naming my solution vector u. Um, we will keep the J for the Jacobian matrix. And then um, for this uh, last vector, I'm going to rename that vector uh, G. And so now I have this formula that we're going to be using, this Newton's method formula. And the questions that you should be asking are this. What the heck is my vector u? What the heck is my Jacobian matrix? And what the heck is this vector g? Okay, so one at a time. My vector u is going to be this. It's going to be a vector with four entries. And the entries are going to be the coordinates of the center of my sphere, x, y, and z naught and the radius of my sphere. So u is going to be this vector, x0, y0, z0, radius. Okay. And then what is g? Well, g is also going to be a vector. And the way I'm going to define this vector g is like this. The first entry in my vector g is going to be equal to the value of this expression right here. The second entry in my vector g is going to be the value of this expression. The third entry is going to be the value of this whole expression. And the fourth entry will be the value of this whole expression. And so what does that mean? It means ideally at the end of my Newton's method algorithm, when I'm done solving this problem, what should my g vector be? Ideally, my g vector should be the vector zero, 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 zero. Because I want all four of those expressions to be equal to what? To be equal to zero. And so this is why I subtracted r squared from both sides of my standard form sphere equation because that way it ends up with an expression that I want to be zero. And the whole idea behind Newton's method, if you'll remember for a moment, the whole idea behind Newton's method is Newton's method is a method for finding zeros. And so in other words, Newton's method is going to allow us to find um, a zero vector for G. And of course, the solution vector U that gives me a zero vector for G. Okay, so now the Jacobian matrix um, is going to be the following matrix. Choose a new color. Um, what does the Jacobian matrix have to be? Well, um, if my solution vector is a size 4 vector, that means my Jacobian matrix has to be a 4 by 4 matrix, right? Because if I'm going to, if you just think about it for a minute, this is a vector, this is a vector, right? Matrix vector multiplication has a product vector. And if I'm subtracting these two vectors, that means these two vectors have to have the same size. So that means um, G has to be a vector of size, uh, what do you call it, size 4, because my solution vector is a vector of size 4. 
And um, that means my Jacobian matrix must be a four by four matrix. Uh, I know it has to be square, it has to be a square matrix because it's, I'm taking the inverse. And invertible matrix, matrices must be square, right? Not every square matrix is invertible, but every invertible matrix is square. I know since I'm taking the inverse that this must be a square matrix, so I expect it to be four by four, and that's the only way it works out. Now the entries of my Jacobian matrix, let me give myself a little bit more room here. The entries of my Jacobian matrix are gonna be like this. The first entry is gonna be the partial of G1 with respect to X naught. And then going down the first column is the partial of G2 with respect to X naught. And then the third entry is going to be the partial of G3 with respect to X naught. And then lastly, I'll have the partial of G4 with respect to X naught. Okay, across the first row, I'll have the partial of G1 with respect to Y naught, the partial of G1 with respect to Z naught, and the partial of G1 with respect to R. Now I expect that you guys, being the very bright students that you are, can see the pattern. You can fill in the other entries in the Jacobian matrix and as one more clue, the bottom right entry in this matrix is gonna be the partial of G4 with respect to R. Okay, now you should, again, know how to take partial derivatives, so you should know how to figure this out on your own. Um, and again, pause the video and see if you can figure this out on your own. Take all of those partial derivatives, find the expression for the Jacobian matrix, and then um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. At this point, I'm assuming you've paused the video and you've tried it out. And I'll tell you the solution now, now that you've already given it a go. But the, the solution to this Jacobian matrix is going to look something like this. Um, 2 times x0 minus x2, 2 times x0 minus x3, uh, 2 times x0 minus x4. I'm going to need a little bit more room in the horizontal direction, but this is going to be 2 times y0 minus y1, uh, 2 times z0 minus z1, negative 2r, I'll tell you the last column should be all negative two r's, and I'll leave it up to you to figure out what goes in these middle entries. I left six entries up for you to figure out, but uh, I, again, I think y'all are pretty good at recognizing patterns, and you should know how to take partial derivatives anyways, so you get the idea of what this Jacobian matrix should be. All right, now um, another point that we should talk about together before I move on with showing you the code, is this. Um, take a look at the Newton's method formula. Give myself a little more space here. And we're taking a look at this Newton's method formula going on. And um, let's see. I can rewrite this like this. The iterate un plus one is equal to the iterate un minus v, okay? So I've named a brand new vector, I haven't used v before, um, and v is what I'm going to call my step change vector. I'm calling it my step change vector because v is the difference between one iterate and the next iterate, right? To get from one iterate to the next, all I have to do is subtract v, which is this step change vector. Okay, so of course v is just equal to the inverse Jacobian times g. Right? v is equal to the inverse Jacobian times g. Now, I could solve for v by first finding the inverse of the Jacobian matrix and then doing matrix vector multiplication to multiply this matrix times this vector. But there's another way I could do things. I can left multiply both sides of this equation by my Jacobian matrix, and I would get this equation. Then I would say, well, the Jacobian times its own inverse matrix gives me the identity matrix. And of course, the identity matrix times the vector g just gives me the vector g. And so there's two ways of finding my step change vector. 
Either I find the inverse Jacobian, which is a lot of work and might involve some round off error. I could do that and then follow it up with matrix vector multiplication, or I could do this. I could take this matrix vector equation and then solve that matrix vector equation for V using Gaussian elimination. So we talked about how we could solve this matrix vector equation using Gaussian elimination in a previous video. And this is the method I'm going to use because we'll see that the Python library called NumPy has a neat little command that's going to solve this matrix vector um, equation using Gaussian elimination and I don't even have to give a whole code for it. I did previously upload a visual basic code for using Gaussian elimination um, to our canvas page but I'm not even going to need to do that. I don't need to reproduce the same code in Python because, like I said, there's going to be a built-in Python command that's going to do it for me. And so that's going to be pretty nice. We're going to go ahead and make use of that. And I'll point that out whenever we get there coding. I think at this point we are ready to begin coding. Um, the last thing I need to tell you is what four points we are going to use. And I'm going to go ahead and use the following four points in 3D space that I want to belong to the surface of my sphere. And those points are going to be 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, and 3, negative 5, 7. Also, in order to use Newton's method, we need some kind of initial iterate and it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but my initial iterate that I'm going to use for the first iteration of u is 1, 1, 1, 1. Nice and simple, and that's where we are. So hopefully you've gotten this written down in your notes, and you won't be confused whenever I mention all of this stuff again as we go about writing our Python code. So now let me bring up my Python editor. I'm going to go ahead and make the font a little bit larger so that you guys can see it. There we go. I'm going to put away my pin. I think we're done with that for now. And then bring out my keyboard, and we are ready to start coding. So the first line is to import NumPy, which is, again, NumPy is just a command library in Python that allows me to do some more stuff with uh, arrays, matrices, vectors, and so on. You'll see it when those commands come up. And then I'm going to create an array here in Python that contains the coordinates of the points that I want to belong to the surface of my sphere. And um, here are the x, y, and z coordinates for the four points um, that we just talked about a second ago. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and initialize some of those vectors. Initialize just means I'm telling Python that, hey, I'm going to use these variable names to represent um, vectors or, you know, in, in programming, sometimes call them arrays when we just talk about lists of numbers, specifically a list of numbers that has a certain shape. What I'm doing whenever I say numpy.zeros is I'm saying, let's go ahead and initialize this vector to just be full of zero entries. And then what I put inside the parentheses is the shape. And so where I just put four, that tells me I'm going to have a vector with four entries. So that's like the g vector, the v vector. These are just vectors where there's four zeros as my entries. For my u vector, it's also going to give me a vector with just four entries, but I'm putting one comma four there as the shape of this vector, because this way it's going to allow me later on to append more iterates. So I'm going to append more copies of the u vector so that I can see how my solution vector is changing with time as I do more iterations of Newton's method. In the j array for my Jacobian matrix, I specified that this is going to be a 4 by 4 matrix. In other words, it's going to have 4 rows and 4 columns.
The next thing should look familiar if you've seen the previous videos. I'm going to say I want to have four significant figures of precision in my answer. And that means I'm going to have an error tolerance of half or 0 0.5 times 10 to the power negative my number of sig figs. That's how much error I'm going to allow to have in my final solution um, in order to guarantee that I have four significant figures of precision. And of course, I'm going to start off my error with a large number just so that my while loop gets started here in a moment. I have to give my initial iterate of u, which is of course 1111. I'm using the double brackets again because that's a special Python thing that's going to allow me to append more iterates onto that array later on. Um, hence the weird double brackets that you see there. I have to give an initial index. So I'm letting n be my iteration number. I'm going to set that equal to 1 for right now. And then the next thing I'm doing is I'm going to calculate the value of my g vector given my initial vector 1111 for the u vector, right? And so I'm using a for loop because all of the entries in my g vector look pretty much the same. I'll remind you of that. So my g vector has these entries g1, g2, g3, g4, and they all look pretty much the same with only the tiny difference that I'm using different coordinates or a different points coordinates for the x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2. That's the only thing that changes between the entries of z, g. So that creates a good opportunity for me to use a for loop to uh, speed up the code right here. So let me explain this first term that I'm typing out. This term is right here, x1 minus x0 squared, right here. That's what we're talking about. In this Python code, p is the, the array that contains the coordinates of my points. I'm saying when I use r, you know, that r is an index that's going to go and vary from 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's saying look at my first point and then look at the first coordinate. In other words, look at the x-coordinate. In u, this first zero is telling me to use the initial iterate of u, and then this next zero is telling me to look at the x-coordinate inside that u vector. Now again, this is just the equation for a sphere, right? And so uh, now I'm talking about the y-coordinate. So it's going to look really similar to the previous term, but um, now I'm working on the z coordinate. And then now I'm subtracting the initial iterates radius squared. Just like in this formula, I have to subtract the radius squared right there. So maybe that looks a little bit foreign to you. Um, but right now, that for loop is going to give me all four entries of my g vector. Um, of course, now in Python. <laughs> so here we go. The next thing I need is actually the big while loop. This while loop is going to iterate once, so it's going to loop around once for every iteration of Newton's method. And it's going to continue to iterate as long as the error in my final iterate is larger than the amount of error I'm willing to tolerate. And I'm going to make sure that it stops if the iteration number gets to 100, right? So if it hasn't converged after 100 iterations, I'm just assuming it's not going to converge and that we've reached some sort of error scenario. Because you know Newton's method doesn't always work. Sometimes it fails. So <clears throat> for every r in the range 0 to 4, for every c in the range 0 to 3, I'm going to have some way of determining what that entry in my Jacobian matrix is. So J is my Jacobian matrix. Uh, the R is telling me which row in the Jacobian matrix I'm looking at. The C is telling me which column I'm looking at. And regardless of the row or column, they all sort of look like this, don't they? When I say U n minus 1, I'm saying look at the n minus 1th iterate of U. Look at the C entry in that vector. And then look at point R 
coordinate C and do that. Then for every row in my Jacobian matrix, I also have that last column, the fourth column, where I have minus 2 times R. Of course, I'm using the n minus 1th iterate of U. I'm using um, the fourth entry in that vector is where I'm storing my radius. Okay? So that little loop fully defines my Jacobian matrix. And so then I have my vector V. And vector V is equal to uh, numpy dot linear algebra dot solve j comma g. I alluded to this before. I told you that um, Python, specifically numpy, has a command that's going to solve this matrix vector equation, jv equals g. It's going to solve it for v using Gaussian elimination. This is the command that does that. So numpy.linearalgebra.solve. Of course, I have to tell it what my Jacobian matrix is. I have to tell it what my g vector is. And then this command is going to tell me what my v step change vector should be. After that, I type u equals numpy.append u comma u and minus 1 minus v. Like I said, I want to be able to take this array, u, and on each iteration, append a new iterate of my u vector. So I'm saying, take this u array and append to it this vector. This vector is the n minus 1th iterate of u minus my step change vector v. So where do we see u n minus 1 minus v? Well, that would be right here. U minus V, that's just going to be the next iterate of U using this Newton's method formula, right? Okay. So that's what gets appended. So that always, always the last row in this U array is the most recent iterate of my solution vector. Now, the next thing I need is I need to determine the value of this g function again. So I'll go ahead, notice I've just copied and pasted this for loop where I previously determined all of the entries of my g vector. This time what's important is I'm not using the initial iterate, but I'm actually using the nth iterate. So now I have to change that zero in my u array to an n, so that way I know I'm calculating my g vector based on the nth iterate of u and not the initial iterate of u. So notice that change, that's going to be pretty important. Uh, don't miss that or it just won't converge. Um, we are almost done with this loop. I just have to determine some way to quantify the amount of error that's happening. And the first thing I'm thinking about is taking the norm of my step change vector. That might not make sense immediately. That's fine. But just remember that the step change vector is the difference between one iterate of u and the next iterate of u. Every iterate of u is only different from the previous iterate by that v step change vector, right? So that means whenever I notice that my iterates of u are getting closer and closer to each other, right? There's less and less difference as I'm iterating one to the next. Um, that means I'm getting pretty close to an actual solution. Meanwhile, if there was a really big difference between subsequent iterations of my vector u, that would mean I'm not actually getting very close to the real solution. So setting the error equal to the norm of the step change vector is going to guarantee that that step change vector gets very, very close to the zero vector before I'm done with my calculation. In other words, that means that my 
solution vector isn't really changing very much on each iteration as I'm getting near my solution. The other thing I want to take into account is that my solution ideally, ideally has my g vector equal to zero. Remember, I want to solve this system of equations where each equation was set equal to zero, meaning each entry in my z ve g vector is equal to zero, right? Again, connecting this, going, trying to go full circle here, Newton's method is for finding zeros. That means I want my g vector to be zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to add to my error term the norm of my g vector. Because if the norm, specifically the Euclidean norm, of my g vector is zero, then that means g is the zero vector, and that means I'm sort of done with Newton's method. And of course, you guys remember from class how to take a Euclidean norm, and so this shouldn't be surprising. I'm squaring all of the entries of my g vector. I'm adding them all together, and then I'm taking the square root of that sum. And the square root, of course, is the same thing as raising it to the 0.5 power. The last thing I need to do inside this loop is to just raise my iteration index and say n equals n plus 1. So then my iteration goes up by 1. Um, I'm almost done. I just need to tell myself if n is equal to 100 at the end of my calculation, then that means my calculation did not converge after 100 iterations. So that way I know I'm not actually looking at a good solution. And then I'm going to print and output the whole array of solution vectors so I can see how it looks on each change. And I'm going to save that and run it. And I really hope it works. And it doesn't. So let me go ahead and troubleshoot, figure out what's going on here. OK, so I'm back. I've looked into it. And um, I haven't made the fix yet, but what I want to show you the issue came with this numpy.append command. And what I needed to do is put square brackets around that. Because what I'm trying to append to this array u is another array. And so to tell uh, Python that this is actually an array I'm trying to append, that's when I have to use the square brackets. And so now let's try it again and hit the green play button. And it works. So the last thing I see is the last iterate of my solution vector. So this should be the real solution for the center and radius of my sphere. And what it's telling me is that this is negative 13 and a half. This is negative 5.46. This is positive 5.81. And this is negative 16.55. Okay, that are those are the four entries in the final iterate of my solution vector. To find out how many iterations this took, I can just type in n equals, and it looks like it took Newton's method 13 iterations before my you know, error, which is you know, those norms I was talking about added together, um, was less than how much error I was willing to tolerate. And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain that these uh, entries, these coordinates of the center of my sphere and the radius of my sphere, um, I'm certain that those are precise or accurate up to four significant figures. And if you want to, look at the previous iterate of my solution vector. And you can see that it's actually the same, um, actually much more than four uh, digits. In fact, the only entry that's even a little bit different is this one. And the first difference appears after one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The ninth significant figure is off in the radius of my sphere in my last two iterates, but everything else is the same. So actually, just by looking at this, it kind of appears that this is good for like maybe like seven significant figures of accuracy. But anyways, you know, this is a pretty good, pretty accurate solution, um, and it only took 13 iterations. So let me um, let me get some more blank paper. Now I can write this out for you. Just have to get out my pen.
What I found is that the 13th iterate of my solution vector has these four entries. Negative 13.5, negative 5.47, positive 5.81, and lastly, negative 16.55. And what this u vector was supposed to represent all along was the coordinates of the center of my sphere and then, of course, the radius of my sphere. So that means the center of my sphere has these x, y, and z coordinates, and then the radius of my sphere is negative 16.55. And that might seem a little bit silly to you to have a negative radius, but I want to remind you that this um, equation, the standard form equation for a sphere, has the radius squared in there. And so even if you plugged in a negative number, squaring it's going to make it a positive number. And so there was always a chance that this could iterate and find a negative entry for the radius. But of course, that just means that your radius of the sphere you can think of as 16.55. Uh, so don't be freaked out by the negative entry for the radius. Um, the last thing I want to do in this video, of course, is check our answer. And to check our answer, I'm going to use GeoGebra. I don't particularly love GeoGebra because I don't think it's super easy to use or anything, but um, in some, some cases it's a necessary evil, so I am, I am grateful that it exists. And I'm going to start off by putting in the standard form equation for the sphere where the x-coordinate of the center is th negative 13.5 the y-coordinate of the center is negative 5.47 the z-coordinate of the center is positive 5.81 and then the radius is of course 16.55. There it is. There's my sphere that we found. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to actually type in what the coordinates of those points we started with were. So to begin this problem, I said I want the points 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, and 3, negative 5, 7. I wanted those four points to belong to the surface of my sphere. And I said we were going to find the unique sphere where all four of those points belong to the surface. And so see if we can find the points um, A, B, C, D on the surface of this sphere. I see A, B, and D. Where is C? Oh, C is way down there. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, hopefully you can, you can tell um, from this video. But all of those points lie exactly on the surface of the sphere. So this is a nice visual, kind of a satisfying way to check our work. Um, just to know that we really did find the center and radius of a sphere that contains those four points on the surface. And there's no other sphere that could contain all four of those points on its surface. Let's change the problem a little bit. So I hope you can see this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, change my D point. I'm going to change that point to negative 3 instead of positive 3. And of course, changing that point means that point no longer lies on the surface of this sphere. But if my code really works for any four points, what I should be able to do is go back to my Python code and make that positive 3 into a negative 3, hit the play button again, I find out that after nine iterations of Newton's method, I come up with this final iterate for my solution vector. And that means these are the x, y, z, and radius of the sphere that contains these four points. So let's go ahead and plug those into my equation for a sphere. My new x-coordinate for the center is, again, negative 13.5, so I don't even need to change that. My new y-coordinate for the center is 2.91. My new z-coordinate for the center is 
positive. Oops, that y coordinate was positive, so let me make that minus. My new z coordinate is positive uh, 0 0.22, and then the new radius of my sphere is going to be 14.79. Okay, so different sphere, but now my new sphere contains all points A, B, C, and D. You can do this as much as you want. <laughs> so let's let's change A. Instead of having 1, 0, 0, let's make a negative 10, 0, 0. Okay, so I just move the point A to that point inside the sphere. To find the new sphere, I just have to say negative 10, 0, 0. I can hit play. And it turns out after five iterations of Newton's method, this is the new x coordinate, y coordinate z coordinate of the center and then the radius of my sphere. So now let's go back to GeoGebra. My new x coordinate is negative 3.6. My new y coordinate is negative 2.55. My new z coordinate is positive 0.57 and my new radius is 6.91. Boom. And that is the unique sphere that contains all four of those points, A, B, C, D, on the surface of the sphere. So it works. We've, you know, we've got good evidence that this code works. The last thing I'll do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust the font size again, make it back to a normal size that you guys can see kind of what all of this code looks like. We were able to do this in just 37 lines of code. Um, and, um, you know, maybe, I hope this isn't too complicated. If you're really struggling with this, if you are sort of re-watching this video over and over and you can't really figure out why I did one thing or another, feel free to come by my office during office hours and ask me about this. Heck, feel free to ask questions about this during class. That would be totally fine. Um, Feel free to um, send me an email or send me a Canvas message. I was about to say feel free to go by the math lab and ask for help, but then I realized that you guys are probably the ones working at the math lab. Um, <laughs> so anyways, actually that brings up a good point. Um, feel free to work with each other on this, right? If you don't understand this, there might be another student in our Calculus 3 class that does understand it, and maybe you can talk to each other, work with each other, um, try to put your, your minds together and see if you can figure out what's going on here. But anyways, um, I really want you to understand what's going on here with this code because we're going to be doing something very, very similar to this as the solution to your project this semester um, because our project during the second half of the semester is going to require us to implement Newton's method for you know a multivariable function in order to solve some optimization problem but in practice, the coding part is going to be very, very similar. I said this before, I'll say it again, that for your project, if you wanted to use Python, that would be fine. If you want to use Visual Basic, that's fine as well. If you want to use um, MATLAB, that would also be fine. I think I'm proficient enough with those three uh, coding languages that I would actually be able to, to grade everything and, and you know, um, assess it well enough. So feel free to use whichever one of those three languages you feel most comfortable with. And if you have any trouble getting access to a programming language, or if you have any problems just using a programming language or debugging your code, um, I'd be more than happy to help. So just bring your laptop by during my office hours and I'd be really happy to help you with that. Anyways, uh, I'll, I guess I'll see you guys in the next video.